Mademoiselle. Ladies and gentlemen, I call this hearing of the House Armed Services Committee Readiness Subcommittee on Aviation Readiness. What's the flight plan to order? A year ago, this subcommittee heard testimony from each of your services about the readiness levels of military aviation, infrastructure challenges, underfunded spare parts, and depot backlogs were a consistent theme. Aviation readiness challenges do not stop at infrastructure. Retention and training of critical skills from trained and experienced pilots to aviation maintenance personnel continues to plague the readiness recovery. All of these challenges are competing with no lessening of operational demand in the fight against global terrorism and with the increasing aging and overused aircraft. Today, I look forward to hearing about each service's aviation readiness, readiness recovery plans, readiness impacts to safety, and where we continue to take risk, calculated in terms of both risk to the force and risk to the mission. I fully believe that the first responsibility of the national government is to provide for the national security of its citizens, and that is especially true of our sailors, soldiers, airmen, and Marines. Therefore, it is our responsibility as members of this subcommittee to continue to better understand the readiness situation and underlying problems across aviation, and then for us to map a course which best assists in correcting any deficiencies and shortfalls. I am grateful to turn to the distinguished gentlelady from the territory of Guam, our ranking member, Congresswoman Madeleine Badayo, for any remarks she may make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning to, to all the fine gentlemen that are here at the hearing today, and thank you for visiting with me so that I could become more acquainted with some of your challenges. I look forward to hearing about uh, some of the problems that you face as an aviation community and hopefully an understanding on what the services are each doing and how Congress can support efforts to improve aviation readiness across the services. In 2016, we learned that shortfalls in our service aviation programs existed from degraded maintenance capabilities to reduced training hours. And we began trying to address these in FY 2017, the NDAA. Just as these conditions developed over time, it will also take time to build back readiness, since these issues, of course, did not arise overnight. What we are continuing to remedy in the fiscal year 2018 NDAA are the consequences of years worth of high operational tempo, aging airframes, degraded aircraft conditions, fewer experienced air crews, and fewer skilled military and civilian personnel to maintain the aircraft. The services have responded by identifying the deficits and prioritizing personnel, training, maintenance, infrastructure, and logistic needs. And the committee has tried to support these efforts through budget authorizations and policy initiatives in the FY18 NDAA. However, this committee is keenly aware that these efforts are rendered less effective by the continuing impacts of sequestration and unpredictable funding through continuing resolutions. When coupled with reductions in skilled personnel at aviation depots, severe challenges in obtaining spare parts for legacy systems, late and unpredictable funding due to multiple continuing resolutions, and the unrelenting operational tempo required by today's complex security environment it is not surprising that we are dealing with readiness challenges. So the acquisition of newer aircraft and the modernization of our existing aviation systems may bring some relief to the stress of our high operational tempo. However, we must ensure there is an appropriate balance between rushing to buy new aircraft and ensuring that we continue investing in the operations and the maintenance of the legacy fleet. Providing more funding may help, but it is not always the answer, and it has become very clear that consistency and predictability in funding is more helpful than increased budgets. So I welcome this opportunity today to hear from each witness about the challenges that they face in their service to achieve and sustain aviation readiness, and how we 
in Congress may be able to help. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Badayo. In connection with today's hearings, I welcome the members of the full committee who are not members of the subcommittee who are or will be attending. For unanimous consent request to permit non-committee members' participation, I ask unanimous consent that a member who is not a member of the subcommittee on the armed services be allowed to participate in today's hearing after all subcommittee members and then full committee members have an opportunity to ask questions. Is there any objection? Without objection, such members will be recognized at the appropriate time for five minutes. I would like to welcome all of our members and the distinguished panel of senior aviators present today. This morning we have with us Lieutenant Colonel Chris Nolan, United States Air Force, Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations, Headquarters United States Air Force. Vice Admiral Mike Shoemaker, the United States Navy Commander, Naval Air Forces. Lieutenant General Stephen Rudder, United States Marine Corps, Deputy Commandant for Aviation. Major General William Gaylor, United States Army, U.S. Army Aviation Center of Excellence and Fort Rucker. General Nolan, we now turn to you for your opening remarks. Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Bordayo, and distinguished members of the Readiness Subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on the state of aviation readiness across the United States Air Force and really this whole committee across the Joint Force. As I personally look back on this opportunity, I realize that only a privileged few get the chance to testify in front of our country's lawmakers, people with the power to make a difference. And I'm excited that I can be here today to talk about a subject I'm very passionate about, regaining full spectrum readiness for the United States Air Force. I look forward to discussing with you where we are today, steps we're taking to recover, and areas where you can support in order to regain full spectrum readiness soonest. For 70 years, our 78th anniversary of this year, the United States Air Force has provided a decisive advantage to the warfighter in air, more recently space and cyber domains. Every hour of every day, airmen support homeland defense, deter aggression from abroad, and provide a robust and reliable nuclear deterrent. However, we are quickly approaching an inflection point. 26 years of continuous operations have taken a toll on the force, and adversaries are beginning to close the technological gap. Today, our combat-coded units hover around 50% readiness rate to meet global demands, specifically for high-end conflict against near-peer adversaries. In short, the Air Force is too small for what the nation expects of it. The Air Force received $5.6 billion in the fiscal year 2017 request, request for additional appropriation, and we spent it wisely. We were able to fund our top priority affecting readiness, growing the force. The funding allowed us to recruit 4,000 additional active duty airmen, which we are using to accelerate readiness recovery by getting our planes back in the air. We made investments in pilot production to address our most critical shortfall, and we outfitted our battlefield airmen with the latest equipment to make them more lethal. We upgraded our fleet's targeting capabilities and increased munitions production. Finally, we funded increased levels of accessions, enhanced network security, and repaired infrastructure serving as the backbone for readiness recovery efforts. These investments will arrest our readiness decline in several critical areas, but shortfalls remain in the near term. The President's budget for fiscal year 2018 lays the foundation to restore readiness and increase joint lethality, but most importantly, an approved budget with stable, predictable funding levels will build the bridge to the future. Continuing resolutions and a return to the Budget Control Act measures will reverse all the progress we've made to this point. With predictable budgets, we can finally set the conditions necessary for the multi-year process of regaining readiness. Since 1947, the Air Force has relentlessly provided America with unmatched, decisive combat power in times of peace, contingency, and conflict. However, our advantage over potential adversaries is shrinking. 
Our nation requires a ready and lethal air, space, and cyber force now more than ever. America expects it, combatant commanders requirement. it, and with your continued support, the United States Air Force will regain full spectrum readiness to ensure our warfighters have an asymmetric advantage in any conflict against any flow. Thank you very much. General, thank you very much. We appreciate your service so much. And we now proceed to Vice Admiral Shoemaker. Good morning, Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Bordayo, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. I'm honored to be here along with my fellow senior aviators to update you on the state of naval aviation readiness. In the next few minutes, I'll reinforce what I know will be a consistent theme from the four of us and was already echoed in the chairman and ranking members' opening statements. As we talk about readiness and what it will take to dig out of the hole we're in, we appreciate your support in making our aviation forces whole again and putting us on a better path to support SECDEF's mandate to increase, increase lethality and remain ahead of peer competitors around the world. In my written testimony, I mentioned Lemoore, California, our West Coast master jet base, as a microcosm for our broader readiness challenges. And I'd like to use our recent West Coast carrier deployments as a call to action. We are meeting the combatant commander's requirement for ready, lethal carriers and air wings forward, but at a tremendous cost to the readiness of our forces at home. For example, to get Carl Vinson, Nimitz, and Theodore Roosevelt ready to deploy in January, June, and October of this year and equip their embarked air wings with the required number of mission-capable jets, 94 strike fighters had to be transferred to and from the maintenance depots or between F-18 squadrons on both coasts. This included pulling aircraft from the fleet replacement squadrons, where our focus should be on training new aviators. That strike fighter inventory management, or shell game, leaves non-deployed squadrons well below the number of jets required to keep aviators proficient and progressing toward their career qualifications and milestones, with detrimental impacts to both retention and future experience levels. Additionally, to get those air wings ready, several hundred parts had to be cannibalized from other Super Hornets across the force, further decimating the readiness of squadrons and adding significantly and unnecessarily to the workload of our maintainers. From a manning perspective, to fill gaps in those deploying squadrons and the three carriers, over 300 sailors had to be temporarily reassigned from other squadrons, have their orders changed, or get extended beyond their normal sea tour lengths, which, hurt our sailors, which hurts our sailors and their families and has cascading effects on enlisted retention across the force. So what can we do to help improve readiness and quality of service? First, consistent, predictable funding that we can execute on 1 October is absolutely required. Then we must buy back the readiness we've lost from years of resource-constrained budgets. Some of it can't be recovered. It's corporate memory, like foundational flying experiences that we no longer have in a generation of pilots. Other readiness shortfalls, like the diminished stock of parts on our carriers and at our bases, must be replenished. Pressurized budgets have forced us to make difficult trade-offs to sustain the readiness of the current force, modernize that force to pace the threat, procure new, new aircraft with high-end capabilities and increased lethality, and add the critical manpower needed to operate and fight those forces, and win as our nation expects us to do. My job as the Navy's Air Boss is to work as hard as I can to give our commanders the resources they need to focus on warfighting first, be ready to operate forward, and be successful when we ask them to sail or fly in harm's way. I hope I can count on your support to deliver that commitment. In closing, although we are carefully managing risks at home, I couldn't be more proud of the way our incredible aviators and sailors are performing with quiet professionalism and excellence at sea and ashore around the world today. Their service is making a difference for our nation, and we must do all we can to keep them ready. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Admiral. We appreciate so much your service. General Rudder. Chairman Wilson, Reiki Menger Bodayo, uh, distinguished members of the House Armed Services Subcommittee and Readiness, and other distinguished members. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in the current state of Marine Corps Aviation Readiness. I would be remiss if I didn't wish everybody in the room a happy Marine Corps birthday. The Marine Corps continues to be the nation's expeditionary force in readiness, and Marine Aviation is prepared to surge and fight anywhere you ask them to. As Deputy Commandant for Aviation, my focus is building readiness for combat. It is and it will continue to be my top priority. As we build race for combat, we will also balance modernizing the force as well as fully investing in our maintenance base. We watch our ops tempo very carefully, and today we have multiple aviation units engaged around the globe. There are F-18s flying combat missions from the land, from aboard Navy aircraft carriers, and operating throughout Asia. Our v 22 stand ready for combat in support of AFRICOM, CENTCOM, and we have aviation combat elements operating on amphibious shipping throughout the world. 
We're also dedicated to helping our fellow Americans in time of need and support of disaster relief operations. This is in addition to our standing deployments and forward posture in the Pacific, where we currently stand ready to support our five allies and multiple partners. Since last year's, our deployment to dwell has improved slightly from an average of one to two to one to 2.6. This means that last year and years prior, we had Marines deployed for six months, but they only had 12 months at home to get ready to deploy again. This year, we were able to keep Marines home for approximately 15 months, so they were able to gain about another three months of readiness time. Again, minor improvements, still short of our target, which would be six months deployed and 18 months at home to prepare for the next deployment. Thank you for your support for additional funds we received in FY17. We have made moderate gains in readiness, but still not where we want to be. Our readiness recovery uh, is strategies built upon sustaining our legacy fleet while modernizing new aircraft, investing in our Marines, and balancing funding into fully funding our readiness accounts. We are 43% complete with our transition of every squadron in the Marine Corps. In the past year, Marine Aviation has proved readiness by roughly 15% in our modern fleet and 10% in our legacy fleet. We are slowly adding aircraft to our flight line. However, we're still about 115 aircraft or 20% short of where we want to be. On average, hours per crew each month increased by almost two hours this year. Last year, we were flying, or in 16, we were flying at 13.5 hours, roughly averaging per pilot. This year, we're 15.4. Not where we want to be at 16.9, but a slight improvement nonetheless. A key part of our race recovery is focusing on our Marines. We are investing in our maintenance Marines who make it all possible. Last year, we identified experience gap at some of our maintenance supervisor levers. Through an update to our MOS manual, we are now tracking prioritized advanced qualifications essential to those positions. Tracking these Marines within squadron ensures we keep the right maintainer in the right squadron at the right place. To further reduce experience gap, we are off offering a aircraft maintainer retention bonus to qualified Marines that have those higher designations. Maintainers who accept the bonus remain in the squadron flight line for two years, supervising and growing the next generation. To date, we have about 350 Marines that qualify for this, uh, and about 130 have accepted. So that's 130 Marines distributed throughout the Marine Corps that are actually going to stay, experienced Marines that are going to stay in the squadron uh, working on airplanes. Also this year, for the first time since 2011, uh, we are uh, giving a pilot retention bonus. So now that we're addressing our critical maintenance manpower, we must invest in supply and depot throughput to support them. Our maintainers do not have enough parts and shells to sustain aircraft on the flight line. With Congress's help in 2017, again, we funded spares to maximum executable levels. In 2018, budget request that's sitting over here, we have again funded to unprecedented levels. In the past, in some cases, we've funded 25% where we were supposed to be. This year, between the Navy and Marine Corps, funding at full levels. We plan to continue this through the fit-up um, for both our legacy as well as our new airplanes. Supply depot improvements allowed us to return 30 Marine F-18s to the flight line this year from the depot and reset 13 long-term down CH-53s. That may not seem like a lot, but out of those 13, those 13 airplanes came out. We've flown over 2,000 hours in those airplanes. The 53s have, their hours have, have increased more than any other community in this past year. Finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to briefly address aviation mishaps. It is our commitment that every time we operate an aircraft that is certified safe for flight and ready for the demands we place on it. Historically, our mishap rates have been flat, but there was an increase in FY17. While there is no direct link between low readiness rates and high Class A mishaps this year, it has my fullest attention. There is no question, no question that naval aviation is inherently demanding discipline, and we cannot discount second and third order effects of low readiness and lack of training reps. Human factors and the pressure to be ready for the next deployment comes into play daily. Like any profession, the more you practice your trade, the better you are at doing it. The true metric of health in aviation is air crew flight hours. While we have increased our average flight hours last year, we are still below what is required. Ten years ago, the pilot, a pilot averaged 16 hours per month. Today, it's 15.4, but that's only part of it. 
three years ago, typically 10 years ago during a three-year three, three rotation, um, uh, typically a three rotation, those pilots average 20% more hours during that three years rotation than the pilots are today. Consider the data and add that to the current operational tempo. That combined with the challenging environment to Marine operate in, there's a marked difference between being current and being proficient. Conclusion for me is uh, thank you again to this committee for all the help you've done over the years. Marine aviation, we continue to prove, but it's fragile. We need as you would imagine, stable, predictable funding over time. We need your help, as you have in the past, to fund those readiness enabler accounts and flight our programs so we can sustain the current slight upward tick and readiness. Recovery readiness also means transitioning to new aircraft, like the F-35 and the CH-53K, as fast as possible in fiscally responsible manner. Simultaneously, we're working hard to sustain as you appropriately put out our legacy aircraft. Mr. Chairman, distinguished committee members, we look forward, Marine Corps appreciates everything you've done. We look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much, General. And indeed, uh, happy 242nd birthday to the U.S. Marine Corps tomorrow. And we now proceed with General Gaylor. Chairman Wilson, Ranking Member Bordayo, distinguished members of the Readiness Subcommittee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today and address Army Aviation Readiness. I'm grateful to represent the Army leadership, the military, and the civilian professionals, and the courageous men and women of Army Aviation who steadfastly serve our nation each day. Army Aviation has provided an unparalleled advantage to our nation as a fundamental element of the joint force, and there's no doubt that aviation will remain an essential element of any combat in the future. However, force structure reductions, increased global requirements, funding uncertainty, and the requirement to train our forces to a higher level of preparedness raise concerns about the overall future readiness of Army aviation. Aviation training is tough under any circumstances. However, to date, we assess that the fiscal environment, coupled with any atrophied maintenance skills uh, or flight hours unexecuted, have not manifested themselves uh, as a, uh, in a, uh, an aviation mishap, mishaps, which in fiscal year 17 remain below the both five and 10 year averages. However, we watch them very closely and are uh, still concerned. If current trends do continue, however, particularly with reduced flight hour execution or funding and combined with a requirement to enter into a high threat environment uh, historically, we do see a rise in aviation mishaps. However, the current fiscal environment and high demand for aviation do pose those challenges. Today's units are resourced to the platoon level proficiency, which is sufficient for the counterinsurgency operations that we have been in in the last decade and a half. However, to fight and win in an increasingly complex environments against a more capable near peer or peer enemy, aviation units would be needed to be at a higher level of proficiency at higher echelons. As turbulence within aviation subsides, we will ask for your continued support to assure sufficient resourcing to achieve that readiness. Readiness also has an equipping component. Aviation initiatives to sustain readiness and to meet global requirements uh, have come at a cost to our modernization. Budget-driven force structure reductions and the current fiscal environment have significantly reduced our budget over the past six years and tests our ability to modernize our force and close key capability gaps with potential adversaries. In the near term, Army Aviation is working tirelessly to develop capabilities to ensure that we maintain a competitive advantage over any potential adversary. And in the midterm, we must make very difficult decisions about our legacy fleet and about the future of vertical lift to ensure that we provide capability to ground commanders that they will need to fight and win on a future battlefield. The United States Army still retains the most modern and best trained aviation force of its kind in the world, and our soldiers, non-commissioned officers, and our officers continue to serve this nation faithfully. Army aviation remains ready to meet any future challenge, no matter the complexity or the risk. Certainly stable, adequate, and predictable funding would enable us to transform into that more capable, lethal, 
and prepared for us for the future. I thank each of you for your continued support to the outstanding men and women in uniform, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify today and equally look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, General Gaylor, and we appreciate your first appearance before this subcommittee. <laughs> and best wishes on your continued success. And uh, beginning with General Nolan, uh, a question I have for each and uh, each person on the subcommittee will have five minutes strictly maintained by Ms. Dean. And so we'll proceed. Uh, the latest projections for rebuilding readiness are based on setting the conditions for readiness recovery. Could you please provide examples of the fragility of the recovery efforts, how fiscal year 2017 funding has shown results in recovering res readiness, and how the fiscal year 2018 will further readiness recovery. Where are additional resources still required? Mr. Chairman, thank you for that great question. The 17 RAA really helped the Air Force. We increased our spending in our flying hour program. We increased our spending in our weapon system sustainment. We increased critical skills availability through people, through buying 4,000 more airmen that we could then put into it. And then the training resources, our ranges and simulators, we also increased spending in those areas. So those levers continue to move forward. The 2018 budget right now, if enacted, once we get the budget, will be good for us. The presidential budget continues to move it. The analogy that I would make is we have to grow the force. So along those paths, we still have areas of risk. Pilot, uh, we have a pilot air crew crisis. Our most highly stressed career field right now is AC-130 gunners. So it's just not a pilot crisis, but the pilots are our most critical shortage. So we will continue to work through that. Um, our maintainers, we will continue to work to train our maintainers to experience them so that they can go from three level to five level to seven level, which is from technician to apprentice to expert. And it takes a while to grow that force. Continued budgetary uh, support will allow us to continue to close out in fiscal year 19 and, and finish our maintenance uh, and fill up our maintenance holes where we have there. Weapon system sustainment, as we talked about, just like the other uh, flags told you, we have challenges. For the most part, our weapon system sustainment is good. We're funded at 90% with a combination of base budget and OCO, but we still need to improve, as you and I talked about, the delivery mechanism, the logistics is the key. How do we get our parts to the far-flung small fleets, such as RC-135s out at Kadena Air Base? Those would be the areas that the continued budget pressure will allow us to continue to move forward with, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, and Admiral. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as we look at, uh, I think I'll refer to the ranking members, uh, Bordio's comments in the beginning when he said, we didn't get here overnight, it's gonna take some time to dig out of the readiness hole that we're in. As I look at fiscal year 17, that was a, that with the request for additional appropriations, that was a, a relatively good year for us in naval aviation in terms of the flying hour count and our readiness enabler accounts. Um, but again, we, it was two thirds of the year, we, our hands were tied a bit while we're still under continuing resolution. In, in fiscal year 18, every one of our, both our flying hour account and our, our flying account, every one of our enabler accounts is plussed up to levels beyond where it was in fiscal year 17. That's, that's goodness. Um, the one area I would continue to focus, and I mentioned it in my opening comments, is in the spares, the APN6 accounts, a critical enabler for us to continue recovering readiness. So the fragility you referenced, Mr. Chairman, I think we've, we just have to have the continued sustained funding over time to get us um, out of the hole we've dug. Thank you very much, Admiral and General Rudder. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The, we have uh, similar uh, with our partners uh, within the Naval Aviation Enterprise have fully funded uh, a lot of our accounts to our executable levels. And if to give you a, an idea what that looks like, in FY16, we're, for spares, we're at 83%. For FY17, uh, with additional money you gave us, we were able to get the 94, and with the budget that we have in now, we're gonna fund it at 96. Now those, you know, predictable budget is always good because that allows uh, our program managers to put, put those spares on contract. So the quicker we get the full budget, the quicker we can get those spares on contract. Some of our, the fragility of it is, is that as our ops tempo has not decreased, 
Uh, we must, one, balance our pilot production, which we're doing, and balancing our aircraft. And as an example, with our F-18 community, probably three, two or three years ago, you know, we might have had five or six F-18s in the flight line, maybe three months before uh, they were getting ready to deploy. And then we pull aircraft from the flight line, inject them into the squadron, and deploy them. We reduced our squadron deployments down to 10 aircraft as a, as a uh, flight line entitlement. And recently, to see some of the progress, although fragile, uh, we deployed the MFA-251 uh, into Asia with 12 aircraft, and they're doing quite well with 10 out of 12 up on a, on a, on a regular basis. So there is some progress being made. Uh, fully funding those accounts has been the key to success. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, General Gaylor, you're finding out your first time here that w time can be cut off. But for the record, we'll give you that question and look forward to your response. But uh, so that uh, all of the members of the subcommittee can participate, we will proceed with Congressman Badayo. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Nolan and Admiral Shoemaker, the, uh, both the Air Force and the Navy have identified manpower shortfalls in the maintenance communities. Now, without a sufficient number of trained and experienced maintainers, you will have challenges generating ready aircraft to support pilot training and operations. So can you describe the actions that you are taking to address manpower shortfalls in the maintenance community and assuming stable funding, and how long will it take to fill these gaps? Do we see any of it presently, or is it still in the future? Yes, ma'am, we are experiencing those problems. As I said, in our maintenance field, we are growing. 4,000 maintainers in 17 is what we're doing, and we expect to close out in 19 to continue to fill those gaps. The other thing we're doing is we're moving maintainers where we can into combat-coded units. So, for instance, as we stand up F-35 units, our training units, we are using contract solutions so that we can move our maintainers into the combat-coded units then as we grow our maintenance and fill our maintenance manning, we will then come back and put blue soup maintenance back into those organizations. But as I said, it takes a while to grow that capability uh, to a three, to a five, to a seven level, ma'am. Thank you, and uh, also to you, uh, Admiral Shoemaker. Thank you, ma'am. So in the, um, so I think in the, in the aviation ranks, at least in our overall accession program. In 17, we increased those assessments from 32,000 to 35,200. Uh, that will take a while to get to the fleet. We're living off, I think, the largest of a, of a fiscal year 13, uh, a very good recruiting year. Those sailors are all now getting to the end of their initial tours and choosing to go to, uh, taking shore duty or choosing to separate. Uh, a couple things we've done to increase the, 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 uh, the, the um, experience level and the level of the maintainers in our fleet squadrons is a couple policy adjustments. One were contract extensions that we offered for sailors on sea duty. We had almost 1,000 take that for almost over, over a year each. So that's um, about uh, 1,000 years of, uh, of sea duty that we increased there. The other one was an extension to the higher tenure gates, the changes to the higher ten tenure gates. That also added about 1,000 years of sea duty into our, um, into our squadrons. Um, as best we can, we're also trying to recycle and reutilize aviation experience in the same type model series. So we avoid the training requirements and costs as they show up and transfer between squadrons. That's an initiative that's getting traction in, um, in Millington and our personnel command. The last one is I know in our fiscal year 18 budget, our request is for additional um, accessions, and I think that will, that will help us. But they take a little while to get to the fleet, and we'll continue to work those policies in the meantime. Well, thank you very much. And uh, my last question is to General Gaylor. Can you uh, share, uh, General, with the committee how recommendations from the Holistic Aviation Assessment Task Force, which is directed by General Milley, has improved Army readiness? And can you highlight some of the recommendations that have been implemented or that you plan to implement in fiscal year 2018 and how they will produce measurable readiness improvements? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much for the question. So, of course, uh, General Milley uh, tasked uh, Lieutenant General uh, Mangum to conduct a holistic, holistic aviation task force assessment. He came up with 63 recommendations, uh, of which 30 of them are completed to date and or have a plan of action to complete. The remainder will be completed by the end of FY18. Most significantly, uh, really, are in the areas of uh, doctrine 
development where we have to align our doctrine to better stay linked with uh, a potential future battlefield and with the greater army. Uh, also in training, we, we have uh, made great strides in adjusting training to uh, bring our forces to a higher level of collective training, which would be necessary on, the, on a future modern battlefield uh, to include UAS integration, unmanned aerial systems integration, uh, and teaming with manned systems. Uh, really a, a, a third area that is most significant is in the maintainer uh, mm -hmm. arena. We have uh, some, uh, some atrophied skills as a result of a few events in the past few years. Uh, so we're focusing very heavily on standardizing a maintainer training program, not only to uh, get all maintainers to the requisite standard, but also to help further uh, kind of increase their maintenance knowledge. Uh, certainly when they get achieve a higher rank, they will uh, would, would need that certain uh, higher level of knowledge. Uh, so it's been very effective for us, and uh, we look to forward to completing it. Thank you very much, General. Now you back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman Badayo. And now we proceed to Congressman Austin Scott of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Nolan, uh, good to see you again. Uh, talk with you a little bit about Moody Air Force Base and the uh, A-29 Super Tucano training program. Uh, it began there in 2015 with the Afghan Air Force, and uh, I know it's been extended to 2020. Uh, now we're training the Lebanese Air Force in a similar program. Can you uh, explain how this program works within the overall strategy of the Air Force? Congressman Scott, great question. Thank you, sir. The, the, this has been a model program, and this is in line with the Secretary of Defense guidance that our national military strategy is in, with, and through coalition partners and allies. So the Afghan A-29 program has been successful because what we've done is we've worked with our government to acquire those airplanes and then transfer those airplanes to the Afghan uh, Air Force. Simultaneously, we brought active duty, reserve, and guard members in to train with the Afghan pilots to get them up to speed. And then we've supplemented them once they go into Afghanistan with air advisors who are with them, taking them through their combat uh, missions. We've seen it to be very effective in helping to train the Afghan Air Force. The Lebanese program is initiated right now. We've also done some work with the Lebanese Air Force to help them with facilities in Lebanon, and we're moving forward along the same model. Our chief believes this is a model of success for the future. We'll try to continue to build on it. I, I agree with you. I mean, the coalition partners, the, the more assets that we can give them, the better off we're going to be. And uh, some have asked how this would actually helps with U.S. Air Force pilot training and the readiness for that. And uh, could you hit on the point of uh, how it decreases pressure uh, on U.S. pilot capacity to carry out the sorties in these other countries? Well, uh, great question again. So, for instance, in Afghanistan, if we have limited capability as we look across the region, and if we have an Afghan Air Force that can talk to the CANDEC the, down to the battalion level and do that close air support that doesn't require F-16s overhead or an MQ-9 uh, Reaper overhead. So therefore, it's enabling them to be successful. We're also training their joint tactical air controllers so that they control it so it becomes organic to the Afghan Air Force, which reduces the demand on our joint force. Mm -hmm. Thank you, General. You know, I, I have to mention the uh, J-STARS and the C2ISR capabilities. Um, we've all heard that uh, we don't have enough of that capacity, uh, and I just look forward to uh, proceeding with the J-STARS recapitalization and certainly appreciate any support that any of you uh, can, can give with us in, in filling that gap. Um, General Gaylor, uh, a graduate from North Georgia Military, I believe. Is that correct? Uh, the delayed risk in infrastructure uh, has increasingly degraded in aviation readiness. Uh, last year, I had concerns about the aging maintenance hangars and uh, support combat aviation units. We received the Army Combat Aviation Hangar Sustainment Report, which detailed the um, Get Well Plan. Uh, are we on track to meet the 80% adequate facilities rating no later than 2025? Sir, it, it certainly depends on levels of funding uh, between now and 2025. We, we currently have uh, nine active duty installations that have infrastructure 
uh, needs that we rate as significant. Um, and even above hangar facilities, we uh, have facility requirements for uh, the prevention of corrosion on repair parts. Mm -hmm. uh, in FY16, we lost $16.2 million worth of repair parts just to corrosion alone. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're working at very hard to get a, uh, a, uh, a steady funding stream and priority to that infrastructure repair and all the installations, uh, but also specifically for that corrosion prevention, which was another a holistic task force uh, review, um, but we do have a lot of work left to do, sir. General, I have a, just a few seconds left, but uh, specifically with regard to Hunter Army Airfield, can you update us on the hangar repairs there? I, I believe I can. We, we did have uh, one hangar that uh, was approved uh, for uh, improvement work beginning in 22 to be complete by FY24. Uh, the uh, General Support Aviation Battalion hangar that's part of that complex uh, is the number one priority on ForceCom's uh, military construction uh, priority list, so we are making some progress. Thank you, General. Gentlemen, thank you for your service, and I yield the remainder of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman mm -hmm. Scott. We now proceed to Congressman Anthony Brown of Maryland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me start by saying that I recently uh, visited with the 10th Combat Aviation Brigade from 10th Mountain uh, in uh, Powitz, uh, Poland, and what those uh, young men and women are doing uh, is phenomenal. They're working interoperability issues with their, their counterparts. They're understanding the terrain, and I think they're really laying the groundwork for an enduring rotational, although one day I would like to see a permanent uh, presence of Army aviation uh, in Europe doing a great job with the UH-60 and the AH-64. I graduated flight school in 1985. The Black Hawk had already been in the field for six years, and we were anticipating a year later the arrival of the AH-64. Uh, by 2030, uh, the Black Hawk will have been in the field for 50 years, uh, and the Apache for 45. I'm sure we'll be looking at those airframes with the same endearing love and affection as today we look at the UH-1, which was the workhorse of Vietnam. So my concern is, and my question, uh, General Gaylor, is uh, the, the need to shift or at least broaden our focus from what today is, you know, short-term readiness to what needs to be more on the modernization, modernization of the force. Uh, we haven't heard much, I think, during this Congress, or at least I haven't been in hearings where uh, I've heard much about the future vertical lift program. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, replacing the aging helicopter fleet? I understand production will start in 2030. And what are the impacts to Army aviation modernization plans and programs under the current uh, level of funding? So thank you, Congressman. First, in reverse, the current level of funding, we, we are certainly, um, based on force structure that we uh, now have as a result of budget realities, we are absolutely strapped uh, to meet demand while simultaneously training for uh, major combat operations at a higher level of uh, readiness, uh, and then while balancing modernization. So it has kind of forced the Chief Staff of the Army to, to prioritize readiness as the number one priority. So um, we, we will continue to ensure that we have ready forces now to meet the demand and for the future. You're correct, we do, we have lost some modernization uh, uh, spending power over the next coming years, and we do have to make serious choices to invest in that capability. Uh, where we have been left so far at the funding levels is incremental modernization, and there's a unique linkage between incremental modernization and readiness. In order to incrementally modernize our fleets, for example, the 864s, we have to take existing airframes out of operational units to induct them into a remanufacture line to improve that airframe. Uh, that impacts readiness because we're taking aircraft from operational units on which they should be training. Uh, on average, across a 24-ship H-64 battalion M, uh, uh, authorization today, we average between 20 and 21 aircraft in the field because we are forced to incrementally modernize. Uh, we do have to change that. And the Future Vertical Lift Program uh, is looking at technologies right now that's in a joint multi-role tech demonstrator uh, that will conclude in FY19. Uh, that will inform what technologies are feasible to meet a capability requirement that we have on a future battlefield. Uh, and then we will aggressively pursue those capabilities 
uh, as we move forward because uh, we do have to maintain the legacy fleet viability though because as you stated sir i mean these these apaches and these blackhawks will be in our force for a long period of time and we have to keep them viable that's why other parts of uh, modernization are critical to us the improved turbine engine program to buy back power in those airframes uh, both the Apache and the Black Hawk are critical. Uh, if we have any CRs, that overall hurts our ability to work developmental efforts. And let me just uh, take back my time, reclaim my time. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I am concerned about the increasing standoff uh, that uh, forces are now facing, will be facing, uh, and we need to make sure that we're uh, improving both the lethality uh, as well as the reach of our aviation assets. Uh, the next question, which I would expect I'd get a response in writing because I'm going to ask a question, and I don't think with my time remaining you'll be able to answer it, uh, General Nolan. It's a parochial question. I'm in the 4th Congressional District of Maryland. Joint Base Andrews uh, is in my backyard. Um, I'm concerned about the uh, replacement uh, program, the Huey replacement program, uh, and uh, if you could give this committee assurances that the program will not face uh, further delays uh, and that it's on track for award in third quarter of 2018, and if not, why not and when? Um, it's an old fleet, uh, uh, the Huey. Surprised that some of them are still in operation. They're having difficulty uh, performing their uh, continuity operations, other base uh, missions uh, at Andrews. So if you could just uh, um, give us an update on that program back through the committee staff or however that's most appropriate, Mr. Chairman. And thank you very much, Congressman Brown. And we now proceed to Congressman Steve Russell of Oklahoma. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, generals, for being here today. Uh, I guess my question would really be for all of you. Um, with respect to flight hours, uh, and General Rudder, thank you for the um, talking about last year and this year, but could you give us uh, just a, a brief thumbnail trend of, uh, of what the average flight hours are currently per month for your pilots? Congressman Russell, across the United States Air Force, our flight hours per month are going in the right direction. We're increasing them across the multiple different series that well, I have. I know have, there's a lot of different airframes, but it's yeah. hard. So, yeah. but in our fighter community, trying to keep it apples to apples, we're averaging about 15.6 in our air superiority, and right around 16 or so in our general purpose attack. Okay. And that really goes back to our readiness aircrew program, which ties simulators and flight hours together for their training. Interesting, okay, thank you. Admiral Schumacher. Yes, sir, so I, I would say we're very close to that in, in aggregate across all type model series. The strike fighter community is a couple hours below, so about 15 and a half across in aggregate and maybe a, cup, a couple hours a couple hours below that for VFA. And just general trends, if I look over time for the annual amount of hours, um, our TAC air communities have come down from around 250 a year to about right around um, 190. So that's a drop from 2011 to 2017. Big Wing, the MPRA, um, E6s, and, and, uh, um, and P8s are all have been fairly steady. Same in our Rotary Force. So the trends down are in our TAC air community. Okay, thank you. General Rudder. Yeah, thank you, Congressman. It's uh, for our TAC air community, they're, they're coming up. So for our F-18 community, they're, they're hovering around 12.7, and not certainly at the 15 hour. Now, that is by the nature we do calculations. We take off one of our deployed squadrons over there. They're averaging from 40 to 50 hours per sure. pilot. And a operational month. deployment goes up. Because right. they're just so, but, but when you average in a squadron, it may be just returned. It's kind of getting themselves back up on maintenance step. Uh, so we're still shooting towards 15. As ta talked about throughout the Marine Corps, 15.4. Uh, we still want to get up to the 16.5 hours, but uh, there's a couple really glimmers of, uh, of hope out there. And certainly with the CH-53, you know, our heavy lift community, uh, they went from 9 to 13 uh, this past year. So that was a, that was a big step. Better. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, for, uh, for the active component, it is 10.8 uh, hours currently. Uh, for our National Guard, it's around 6.4 and 7.8 for the reserve component. Um, what we try to achieve is 14.5 hours per month per crew to reach a collective readiness level at the battalion level. 
we could achieve that in our UH and CH-47 fleets. Uh, the AH-64 fleet is somewhat capacity limited uh, because of shortages of the airframes uh, and, and some of the pilots. Thank, Thank you. you. Right, and uh, the other question I have is on pilot retention and pilot generation. Uh, I know there was a lot of hoopla made about maybe uh, bringing retirees in, but really this authority was always available, uh, as I understand it, to the services to recall uh, folks uh, that were retired if they needed to. Uh, do you see an age gap uh, developing because of accessions of new pilots and then trying to retain uh, with incentives and other programs? Uh, if you if all could speak to that in the time I have remaining. Congressman Russell, we are um, we just received greater authorization to do it for a longer period of time, so we will be looking at that. I don't anticipate uh, necessarily an age gap. The retirees we intend to bring back, number one, will try to fill staff positions, which sure. would then training, allow our training base, maybe also, or yes, sir, and then at training bases. In which case, when you look at your instructor pilot, they all look old to you. So you know. Yeah. Well, and, and I appreciate that because a lot of times you, know, you have captain instructors, which is not a bad thing. They're current. They're coming from the field. Uh, but I, I was curious on that. So thanks. Uh, Admiral Shoemaker. So we uh, heard about the Air Force initiative and actually looking at that in, in our production world as well, um, where we're trying to catch back up, certainly in T-45s. Most of you all are familiar with the operational pause we took. Um, in the general trend across the force, though, I think – you know, other than a couple of targeted communities, via the F-18 community and our Growler uh, Advanced Airborne Electronic Attack, um, we are meeting our department head requirements with quality. Thank you. General Rudder. As we look across our fleet, we, we expect about a 7% fleet-wide um, departure rate on a yearly basis. Now, for our TAC Air community, much like uh, Shu just said, um, you know, we're up around 9.5, 9.9, with the average over the year about 9. So we have seen about a 1%, 1.5% uh, uh, increase in his departure. So we're, we're approaching it from all angles. We're approaching it from our ops tempo, uh, readiness. Uh, as you would imagine, pilots want to fly, and we're not flying. They're not happy, so we're trying to increase the readiness out there. And, again, we're trying to give incentives to keep, to keep people in. But it is a concern, obviously, when the economy is doing good, airlines are doing good. I think to include all the helicopter guys and gals out there, they are being approached on a daily and regular basis uh, because there is other shortfalls out there with our, our airline uh, partners. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, with indulgence, I hate to leave my Army brother, uh, you know, hanging in the wind if, if he could answer that with your indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please proceed. Thank you, sir, and I'll be brief. Uh, yes, sir, we, we have targeted specifically some of the uh, more senior uh, qualifications to uh, remain in the operational fleet, and uh, we use heavily uh, some Department Army civilian aged uh, experienced uh, in the institution, so we, we watch it carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Congressman Russell. And we now proceed to Congressman Don McEachin of Virginia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you all for being here. General Nolan, uh, would you be kind enough to discuss the intent behind the Air Force Enterprise Range Plan, the potential benefits of the regional training range approach, and what the Air Force hopes to achieve as the ERP process is completed? Congressman, great question. I'd love to. We believe that the enter Enterprise Range Plan will make us uh, more efficient. So what we need to do is we need to look at our ranges holistically. Our ranges are national treasures. And so we've got to look right now the way we've, we command and control them. We don't create as, as many efficiencies as we think we can. So we believe by creating a rent an enterprise range plan and pulling it together regionally, we will be better coordinators with our sister services as we look at how we can possibly expand the ranges and increase investment also in our ranges. We have limited investment dollars. Where do we put the high-end simulators into which ranges so we get the maximum training value out of every sortie we fly? Thank you, and that's a nice segue into my next question to, to Admiral Shoemaker and General Rudder. Can you discuss the potential benefits to your services of the Air Force con consolidating its six regional training ranges? Is there a potential to better leverage these ranges to improve training across all services? And can you also discuss the challenges each of your services face in acquiring technologies like threat emitters that allow your respective service air components to simulate advanced threats? 
Yes, sir. Thank you very much. The um, as we merge the enterprise plan that uh, General Nolan just described, our our premier training range is obviously Fallon, Nevada. And as we introduce ne new technologies, we are clearly figuring out that the airspace limits and the electromagnetic spectrum limits are not allowing us to fly uh, those our new platforms to their full capabilities. So it's driving us into a, into a virtual and constructive world. And we've we've moving out with that with a couple of key facilities in Fallon right now that will link to all of our fleet concentration areas, but certainly tie into our Air Force counterparts. Um, as I talk about Fallon, one of the things we do um, we do require, and you mentioned it, sir, were emitters. And the ranges out there are working with some very dated systems, so we bring on our new electronic attack airplanes and certainly the F-35 to be able to practice and train against something more re representative of the threats we might see is, is essential. Thank you. General? Yeah, thank you, Congressman. I, I would make as a, as a general statement, our ranges and our airspace that we're able to operate in on a regular basis are, should be considered a national treasure. And any time that we can increase the efficiency, uh, we should produce that and protect what we have. And when able, uh, when it makes sense, expand airspace, even with the crowded airways as we know them today. We, there are challenges. We, we are fortunate to be able to participate in great exercises like Northern Edge and Red Flag and operate out of Fallon so we, or China Lake or other areas around where we can take advantage of their first-rate threat systems that allow us to train at levels we need to train. And with the F-35 coming on uh, board on larger numbers, uh, we will be challenged in the future to make sure that we have the amount of airspace built to train with that airplane, no doubt about it. And we've got to get very progressive and how we think about airspace and how we fight this airplane and how we fight the network uh, within our range areas because there are competing, uh, there are competing uh, you know, uh, uh, communication bands out there we need to deal with and computing airspace uh, requirements. So I, I would uh, echo with all my counterparts here that range space is, is critical and the more we think through this and make, make our ranges more complex and more progressive, it will help the joint force all the way around. I thank each of you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman McKitchin. We now proceed to Congressman Salute Carbajal of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you to all the witnesses here today. Uh, marine pilots remain short on average about one-third of their required flight hours. One-third of the Army's aviation force has been forward deployed at any one time over the past 15 years. The Navy has extended deployments and shortened, eliminated, or deferred aircraft maintenance and training periods. The Air Force does not have enough experienced maintainers to sustain good quality aircrafts, not enough available mission-capable aircrafts to conduct operations, and airmen and, air and airwomen are meeting the minimum. Training requirements for their deployment missions. We are not doing our part to keep our service members safe, it seems. We are sending our sons and daughters into theaters of war without fully functioning equipment and inadequate training. This is unacceptable, obviously. We are willing to spend $1.2 trillion modernizing our nuclear arsenal, and yet we are unable to take care of more eminent essential matters, such as fixing our aircrafts, providing more flight time, time-sensitive training, and modernizing aviation infrastructure. Are we really prioritizing readiness? Even under current budgetary constraints, we should be providing our military with the most effective training, even if it means spending less or just not spending on something else. We can't spend on everything. Training should be a top priority. To what extent are the service services evaluating the effectiveness of training to ensure that completed training meets its expectations for quality. Congressman Carbajal, uh, great question. So for the United States Air Force, we've made training a priority. It's a Secretary of Defense, so regaining readiness soonest means rebuilding your operational training infrastructure and funding your training lines. In the A3, we have stood up a whole training division, operational training infrastructure, led by two-star Major General Scott Smith, whose sole job is to come in and think about it every day and then advocate and work with our commanders to make sure we can improve our training capability. 
Congressman, I, I think we've been fairly successful, and at least what CNO has talked about minimizing the extensions to deployments and staying trying to stay within his seven month goal, and that's that's been the case so far. But obviously, real world real world events will play into that. As we work our our air, our air wings and and carries up, we work through the uh, optimized fleet response plan, and that right now I think is a good model for us to take the resources we are given. Although we we could certainly, as we've talked about earlier. Um, you know, do more um, as we're working up, but that gives us the ability it, with the resources given to generate the best capabilities for our forces moving forward. Now, we are accepting risk on the early parts of that that workup cycle, but we make sure that as we get into the more integrated and advanced, we've got the resources they need, airplanes, people, um, and flying our dollars ordinance to deliver so that we are, so that our energies are focused on those next to deploy and on deployment. They're ready, they're certified, um, they're ready and certified forward. Yeah, I'd echo what you just said, is the Commandant's priority is to make sure that when forces uh, go out the door on deployment that they're ready to go. And that may come at expense of some of the remain behind forces. That, that's where we get the challenge of a ready bench behind. Uh, but our, our forces, before they go forward, have uh, are given the appropriate workup time, and they do get certified before they go out each time. Uh, back to another point you made, I think where we're trying to balance uh, our readiness counts is you know, what we have done in the Marine Corps and I think all the services, we defer buying new airplanes or new stuff, if you will, to pull that money into our readiness account. So we're, we're balancing both, the really new stuff for the capability we need for the, for the future fight with making sure our readiness is right so when we do send Marines and sailors out the door that they have the right gear at the right time at the right readiness level. Sir, I would echo that uh, it is a balance, uh, certainly to meet demand, train for the future, uh, assess your readiness for both, and then to modernize. Uh, we we uh, take it very seriously. Certainly every aviator that uh, deploys is uh, incredibly competent to the resource level that they are uh, trained to uh, and resourced for. Um, as we look to assess ourselves and know where that risk is, we actually measure our training readiness to a higher battalion level level of readiness called Objective T uh, so that we can see where we need resourcing and we can see where the risk is. So, Thank you. I yield back. And thank you very much, Congressman Carbajal. And at this time, uh, we'll uh, proceed, uh, and that is Admiral Shoemaker and General Rudder. I have a question for the record that I would like for you to get back to the subcommittee. In February, the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Bill Moran, testified that 62% of F-A-18 aircraft were out of service. Over 50% of the out-of-service aircraft were simply awaiting maintenance or parts. In the committee report accompanying the House National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2018, it was expressed support for an alternative source contract for FA-18 depot-level maintenance. Such alternative sourcing ensures competition, best value, and sustainment to be an effective, competitive industrial base. We have also encouraged the Navy to meet the contract's maximum authorization within each year of the contract. What assurances can you provide that the Navy plans to maximize the number of aircraft authorizi authorized by the existing alternate source contract for each year going forward as supported by this sub subcommittee in the NDAA report. What are the Navy's plans to establish a multi-source competitive environment for the FA-18 depot level maintenance? And, and again, as we conclude, and it's always um, a delight to be serving uh, with our ranking member, Congresswoman Badayo, uh, we want to thank General Nolan Admiral Shoemaker, General Rudder, General Gaylor, again, congratulations on your first appearance here for being with us today, and again, happy 242nd birthday. Uh, thank you for your service, and thank you for your personnel for your service to our nation. And we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Get your flight. Yes.